If there's one thing most people know about the dodo bird, it's that they were dumb. If they had been human, they would have been the kind of person who changes pants while driving. Yes, legend has it, this creature was only really ever a danger to itself, a true poster child for the Darwin Awards. At least, that's the story we've been fed. But is it true? Turns out the whole story that the dumb dodo got itself hunted to extinction by being so stupid may have been a big load of doo-doo. Leon Klassen, professor of vertebrae paleontology and evolution at Netherlands Maastricht University, believes the Dutch sailors who first encountered the bird in 1598 didn't actually hunt the birds to extinction, though the sailors likely had an indirect role in the demise of the species. Previously, it was believed the birds were fat and were hunted for food. But in the dense jungles of their native Mauritius, the bird would have been much leaner than previously thought, and therefore not as appetizing of a meal. Further, these jungles would have also made it much harder for the few hundred sailors to catch the birds, regardless of how unafraid the dodos were of human beings. Classens believes the real problem was the rats and other animals that would have landed with the sailors. These animals would have been able to multiply quickly in an unrestricted habitat and would have feasted on dodo eggs and outcompeted them for food, a double extinction whammy. And then the triple whammy hit, rapid habitat loss. The island of Mauritius was not initially considered very valuable, just a place for ships to stop over. Some even thought the island was cursed due to a large amount of shipwrecks in the area. That all changed when the Dutch realized they could export the island's ebony wood for sale, which became the island's primary economic activity. Not long after, settlers were turning the once wild island into a big agricultural plantation, leading to heavy deforestation and loss of native plant species. The forest that provided natural protection for the dodo bird gave way to sugarcane fields, making the birds oversized sitting ducks for any predator who came along, as the dodos literally had no fight or flight reflex. Lack of flight also made dodos ill-suited to surviving natural disasters. Evidence has been found that even before human settlement, many of the birds died in flash floods brought on by cyclones. Once they lost the natural protection of their sheltered forests, they became even more vulnerable. The entry for dodo in the Oxford English Dictionary describes something that is no longer effective, valid, or interesting, and the origin of the word comes from the Portuguese dodo, translating to simpleton. It's a sad legacy for what was once a beautiful, totally innocent creature. Beyond their reputation for stupidity, dodos are a symbol of how quickly and profoundly humans can impact an environment and drive a species to extinction. Until we can clone them, dodos are gone forever, and the best thing we can do about it is to learn from the mistakes of our ancestors. It only took a hundred years to wipe out the dodo, and while exact dates of extinction vary, most believe the dodo was gone by the 1660s, with other reports claiming they lasted on nearby islands until the 1690s. In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter much, because either way, the bird and just about every trace of it is gone forever. All we've got are a few records and sketches from sailors and one or two shoddily stuffed birds in museums. We're hardly even sure what color they were. Most paintings from the time show dodos with white feathers, but first-hand accounts describe them with gray to black plumage. Heck, we didn't even know they had kneecaps until 2014, after a 3D scan of the last remaining skeleton revealed them. So have we learned our lesson? Not yet, it seems. In another 100 years, it's estimated that 25% of all bird species will be extinct in the wild unless we take big steps to clean up our act. If not, we'll be the real dodos. Beards are in. The bearded look was once reserved for mountain men and lumberjacks, but just about anyone can rock a beard these days. But what does all this scruff mean for men's faces? Here are scientific effects that happen when a man grows a beard. Attraction is a matter of personal taste, but in general, the majority of people find men with beards to be more attractive than men without beards. So you got rid of the beard? Yes, I did. I thought that was kind of cool. And you feel the same way about it? Yeah, you look smaller. Weaker. Okay. <laughs> According to a study by the University of Queensland, over 8,000 heterosexual women were surveyed, and on average, they preferred men with at least some scruff. Dudes with 5 o'clock shadow were seen as better one-night stand propositions, whereas men with fuller beards were assessed as better long-term partners. And another study found that gay men agree, as they gave higher ratings to men with beards. You know who looks good in a beard? 
Dumbledore. Why is this the case? Well, according to Psychology Today, studies have shown that men with beards are genetically regarded as more masculine, dominant, and socially mature, as well as more responsible. The one downside is that studies show people consider men with beards to look angrier and more aggressive as well. According to a study by researchers at the University of Queensland, who apparently are fascinated by beards, having facial hair reduces your exposure to sunlight by about one-third compared to a clean-shaven face. In fact, beards can offer the equivalent of up to a 21 UPF, making it nature's sunscreen. This protection actually keeps the skin on a man's face looking younger as well. Which is why when your Uncle Joe shaved for the first time in 40 years, he looked younger than you. What do you want to be? Ever wonder why Santa sports that giant fluff bag on his chin? The answer is pretty obvious, actually. Having all that hair helps keep a man's face warmer, which would be particularly handy if you lived at the North Pole. Where do you think you're going? North. According to popular science, these hairy scarves keep the skin underneath one degree warmer than it is in unguarded areas, which might sound small, but definitely makes a big difference. Strangely enough, though, a study published by the British Journal of Dermatology found that beard hair actually grows faster in the summer and slows down during the winter. So men who want to keep their faces warm at Christmas better start growing out their beards on the 4th of July. Men don't choose whether or not to grow a beard, they can only choose if they want to shave it off. And there are good reasons not to shave. Most people who shave experience some degree of skin irritation and even ingrown hairs, both of which can be avoided by letting the beard grow. As Vox points out, workplace beard bans marginalize men who possess thicker, curlier types of facial hair. Dealing with ingrown hairs is bad enough, but for many men, frequent shaving can also cause permanent scarring, razor bumps, dark marks, and even infections. Not funny. That is not funny. <laughs> hey, you've only got a short time left on this earth, and do you really want to spend 3,350 hours of it standing in front of a mirror, scraping sharp metal against your cheeks? According to the New York Times, that's how long the average man spends shaving during his lifetime. No matter how hard, how often, or how aggressive you shave, your bristles will grow back a little every day. Now zoom in on all those little facial hairs and picture them as a forest of tree trunks. The perpetual act of chopping them down day after day seems like a lumberjack's endless existential nightmare. The whole poopy beard scare of 2015 will not be forgotten anytime soon, but for those who missed it, that year saw headlines blow up about a so-called study claiming beards carried more fecal particles than a toilet bowl. Gross, right? Luckily, it turns out the whole thing was bogus. In fact, the opposite is actually true. A study published by the Journal of Hospital Infection took samples from 408 male hospital workers, both with and without beards, and it was found that clean-shaven faces were three times more likely to be carrying MRSA bacteria. Yikes! Than hairy ones. Plus, the study also found that beards might contain a type of bacteria killing bacteria, which could potentially be developed into powerful new antibiotics. Thank you, beards! There is one potential downside to having a beard. According to The Guardian, a study funded by Guinness found that the average bearded beard drinker loses about 0.56 millimeters of beer per pint because it gets caught in their facial hair. This annoying beard tax adds up. And according to Pacific San Diego, if you drink 180 pints a year, your total yearly loss could be about a pint and a half. What a waste of a good drink. In the grand scheme of things, there aren't many ordinary people who have names remembered by history. Unless, that is, something extraordinary happens to them. The extraordinary certainly happened to Phineas Gage on September 13, 1848. Unfortunately for Gage, that extraordinary thing was pretty gruesome. Here's why Phineas Gage is still fascinating, even today. What happened? 25-year-old construction foreman Phineas Gage was helping cut a new railway bed through Cavendish, Vermont, and was using a tamping iron to pack explosives into a hole. And then, this happened. The explosives detonated early and sent the four-foot, 13-pound tamping iron through his left cheek, into his brain, and out his skull. Making things worse, according to legend, he might not have even lost consciousness. Historical documents say that he was driven into town where he sat on a porch chair and chatted to passers-by as he waited for Dr. John Harlow. After a few days, he developed a brain infection that left him even closer to the Grim Reaper's door. But the Reaper had apparently been impressed enough with what he'd already survived to give him a pass. He recovered, lost use of his left eye, and went home two months later. Everyone who knew him before and after the accident agreed he had changed, and when he died in 1860 after suffering a series of seizures, he remained a part of historical and medical infamy. 
pioneering neurology. Gage is one of the earliest documented cases of traumatic brain injury, and his accident couldn't have come at a better time for the science of neurology. When Dr. Harlow first documented Gage's story in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal in 1848, no one believed it. It wasn't until 1850, when Harvard professor Henry J. Bigelow wrote a piece on him being a fully functional human post-accident that people started to notice this medical miracle. Bigelow's follow-up report in 1868 focused on the mental manifestations of the accident, saying, He had become fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, and manifesting but little deference for his fellows. In short, the guy who got a giant metal spike through his head allegedly became a jerk. Neurologists at the time insisted that we needed to look inside the brain to unlock the secrets of what made us human, and Gage was the first documented case that provided evidence for this. So we should probably be thanking Gage for his unwitting scientific contributions. Insane in the Brain There's still a ton we don't know about brain function today, and we can't always peek inside to see what's going on. So we have to find other ways to get a look. Gage's accident and his big, open brain was helpful in doing just that. We know what part of his brain sustained the most damage, the prefrontal cortex. And we know what happened to him afterward. His memory was intact, and he was perfectly capable of working, traveling, and doing everything else a responsible human should do. But everyone also agreed that his personality underwent a big change, which was pretty good proof that our personality lives in our prefrontal cortex. While some sources say post-accident Gage was a depraved monster, I'm still the same man. I'm the same man! Look at yourself, Phineas! Give me my job back! You, you give me my job back! Other documentation shows he managed to maintain a pretty normal life. It is also written that he exhibited himself in freak shows, and that he had no more social inhibitions, was a perpetual drunk, and even that he was described as psychopathic. He's like an animal now. An animal's emotions in a man's body. But there's nothing in Dr. Harlow's writings that suggests anything of the sort. And his mother testified he was eager to keep working after the accident and loved making up stories to tell his nieces and nephews. Psychopath? Storyteller? Or something in between? No one's entirely sure. New Insight Technology has come a long way since Gage's accident, and it's a lucky thing that we still have his skull. The official cause of Gage's 1860 death was complications from epileptic convulsions. No autopsy was performed after he died, but Gage's body was exhumed seven years after his burial, and his brother-in-law took both the skull and tamping iron to Dr. Harlow. Today, both artifacts are housed in Harvard's Warren Anatomical Museum. We don't have any direct information about Gage's brain, but we do have two of the most important tools needed to recreate what happened to him. His skull was mapped and diagrammed as early as the 1940s, according to NPR. And as technology has improved, we've gotten increasingly better looks. In 2012, researchers from the Laboratory of Neuroimaging used a combination of techniques to map exactly what connections were severed when the tamping iron sliced through his skull. And they found something pretty interesting. The white matter in Gage's brain likely sustained damage less severe than you might expect, similar to the damage done by a typical brain lesion. Pretty lucky for such a seemingly unlucky guy. We can overcome. There's a lot of gory stuff that's involved in talking about Phineas Gage. He's still the poster child doctors point to when they want to show patients and their families what the human body and brain can overcome, even without the miracle of modern medicine. If there's one good thing to come out of Gage's insane, life-changing accident, we think he'd be happy to be an inspiration to people going through similar, life-altering traumas, which is pretty fascinating. We humans have had a pretty good run on this planet, but everyone knows it can't last forever. At some point, people will go too far, or Mother Nature will get us all. Here are the most likely ways the human race will come to an end. The Doomsday Clock It's not just for boosting DC's book sales anymore. Since 1947, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists has been tracking potential threats to humanity's existence via a metaphorical clock, with each progressive tick toward a world-ending midnight representing the threat of a more eminent potential end of human civilization. According to the physicists, biophysicists, diplomats, and inventors who contribute to the bulletin, we've only ever come within two minutes of a world-ending nuclear disaster twice. Once in 1953, when the US and the Soviet Union started testing atomic weapons as a means of freaking each other out, and again in 2018. Why so glum, expert chums? Well, with the United States' recent abandonment of the decades-old Intermediate-Range Nuclear Forces Treaty and also of the Iran nuclear deal, 
as well as major funding hikes to nuclear armament, maybe they're just a little skittish. Remember that time a pair of nukes dropped on North Carolina? Two bombs roughly 200 times more powerful than the ones used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II? That's alright, it was one of those funny little oopsies that fly under the radar until the documents are released five decades later. So goofy. Yuck, 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 gosh! It sounds like a wild internet conspiracy, but it's true. In 1961, an American B-52 bomber broke up while flying over Goldsboro, North Carolina. It then jettisoned its payload two nuclear bombs. One bomb's parachute deployed and it remained unarmed. The other ones didn't. It armed itself, and here's the really cool thing. Nobody is positive why it didn't detonate. All of this would be terrifying enough, but near misses like this happen more often than you'd think. There was the 1980 Damascus Titan missile accident in which a missile silo in Arkansas exploded, or that time in 2007 when a pair of nuclear weapons just sort of went missing for a day and a half. And those are just a few of the ones we know about. The near miss is one of at least 700 significant incidents involving nuclear weapons recorded between 1950 and 1968. Combine the massive destructive force of atomic weapons with mankind's potential for giant screw-ups, and what do you get? The very real possibility of an end-game scenario. An accident like any of these could activate America's computerized mutually assured destruction protocols, automatically launching thousands of missiles at Russia and triggering an apocalyptic unintended exchange of enough bombs to effectively kill the planet. Who knows, maybe we live up to the challenge of responsibly maintaining more nuclear weapons than there are Popeye's restaurants in the world. Maybe the safety measures put in place are enough to cover every nightmare scenario, and no terrorist cell or enraged dictatorship will ever start us on the path to Mad Max. Maybe the nukes will go unnuked. But don't sleep soundly just yet, because you know what's cheaper and more accessible than a mushroom cloud? An aerosol can full of a particularly bad sneeze. Hold on. Oh my god! Eddie. Biological weapons are cheap easy to produce, and nearly impossible to detect before the damage is done. In short, there's a reason that entire government office buildings shut down when there's so much as a hint of exposure to anthrax. But wait, it gets scarier. Experts say these untraceable death machines are getting even more accessible and dangerous with the rise of technology like the CRISPR gene editor. And they were already pretty bad before they could be custom-built. Joy. Scientists agree. Earth's temperatures are rising, there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than at any point in human history, and we might just be beyond repairing the damage. Here's how it works. Greenhouse gases like CO2 and methane absorb heat from the sun and reflect it back into the atmosphere, warming the planet. It's an observable fact that you can test for yourself at home. As humans release more and more of these gases into the air through industrialization and vehicles, the temperature continues to rise, changing the world in so, so many terrifying ways. Permanent effects have already been documented. In 2016, scientists announced that a species of mammal had gone extinct due to climate change for the first time. The Bramble K. melomus was suspected of going extinct in recent years, but it was made official recently. The ice caps are melting, raising ocean levels to the point where cities like Venice are flooding, killing residents. As weather patterns become more extreme, entire areas of the world could become uninhabitable, economies could crumble, ecosystems could collapse, and according to NASA, it'll take decades, maybe even centuries to stop, even if we stop producing CO2 right this minute. Maybe it's a little dour to pin all the potential end-of-days blame on human beings. After all, a deadly, highly contagious microscopic organism could sweep through mankind and we'd all die with a clean conscience. Historically, the only thing that's killed more humans than humans has been disease. A few of the all-stars? The Black Death that killed between one-third and one-half of everyone in Europe in the 14th century. The 1918 Spanish flu pandemic that infected a third of the world and killed more than 50 million. AIDS has led to the death of at least 25 million. The good news first. You'll notice that those numbers keep getting smaller with time. Our ability to confront and contain diseases gets better all the time. Now, the bad news. Diseases are getting better at fighting back. Overuse of antibiotics has made drug-resistant bacteria. Newer, more impressive strains of the flu come every year, and despite our remarkable advances, we still can't cure viral infections. 
combine all these facts with the knowledge that an infected person can travel more easily across the ocean than ever before, and you'll understand why doctors would just love for you to go get your flu shot. Man's ability to eat up resources is unparalleled in nature, and that can mean the end of delicately balanced ecosystems. It can be seen today in the way we suck the life out of rainforests, or in the rapid decline in worldwide insect populations due to the destruction of their natural habitats. Some scientists point to the collapse of ecosystems in the past as the beginning of a new era, dubbed the Anthropocene era, in which human actions such as deforestation and oil drilling caused more change more dramatically than any natural phenomenon in history. They posit that it could lead to worldwide biome instability. That said, we've seen it happen before, and it hasn't always been our fault. Around 1000 BC, a natural disaster near Iceland threw the northern hemisphere's environment into disarray, cooling temperatures and blocking out the sun to the point where crops died out. What sort of event could trigger this on a global scale? Yes, Yellowstone could explode. It probably won't, but hey, it could. Yellowstone is home to roaming herds of bison, the old faithful geyser, and a supervolcano so deadly that if it erupts, it will make Michael Bay pack it in and start producing ASMR videos. Dubbed the Yellowstone Caldera, it's upsettingly big, bigger than you're thinking, significantly larger than Manhattan. The crater stretches for 1,500 square miles. What would happen if this puppy blew? Worst case scenario, it could spew enough dust particles into the atmosphere that the air would become unbreathable. The sun would be blotted from the sky. Plants would die off, ecosystems would crash, mass extinctions would rock the world. So, take comfort in the fact that, despite the occasional tabloid claims to the contrary, Yellowstone isn't in danger of going up anytime soon. And even if it did, things likely wouldn't be that bad. Then take fear in the knowledge that there are two other supervolcanoes in the United States, an even bigger one in Indonesia, and over a dozen more around the globe. Oh good, that makes me feel so much better. So, let's be real. People have been warning that cataclysmic overpopulation was just around the corner for thousands of years. The thing is, as we approach the modern era, medicine improved. So did technology. Suddenly, things like disease and horrifying infant mortality rates weren't keeping us down the way they used to. Hitting 50 stopped being considered old age. Birth rates skyrocketed and grew exponentially. It took us 120 years to get from 1 billion to 2 billion, and only 32 years to get from 2 billion to 3 billion. In 1999, the Earth's population hit 6 billion. 12 years later, it crossed 7 billion. With no new continents to colonize or imperialize, we're running out of places to put people and the resources to support them, although we've slowed way down on the growth. Still, it's part of why Stephen Hawking, in a speech given shortly before his death, stated that the move to other planets needed to happen soon. I have no doubt that we will eventually find ways of crossing the immense distances of space in just a few years. The idea of an exploding star is undeniably awesome and science fiction adjacent, but putting to one side the fact that we have no way to stop the sun from eventually engulfing the Earth like an unimaginably large Pac-Man eating a single dot that contains all of human history, you might think that our humble planet is pretty safe from any damage that heavenly bodies might hold. Then comes along science to give you more night sweats. Apparently, the dangers of a star going supernova aren't confined to planets with an up-close view. If it happened to a relatively close star, the Earth could be positively drenched with radiation in the form of gamma rays, the kind you might think would hulk you out but would actually just kill you, and X-rays, the kind from the doctor's office that boil your skin if you don't use them correctly. The ozone could burn, or the nitrogen and oxygen in the air could ionize. So, how many stars are close enough to be concerning? That's the exciting part. We're not entirely sure, but probably a few hundred. From Terminators to Ultron to Black Mirror, pop culture has been making humanity eat its robotic hubris vegetables for a while. And what have we learned? If all those Boston Dynamics videos are any indication, not much except for how to make scarier robots. To figure out how the rise of a super-intelligent new race of self-aware machines would change the world IRL, we turn to the expert researchers at the University of Cambridge's Center for the Study of Existential Risk. In an experiment that'll have you saying, that's what they do at Cambridge, researchers modified the game Civilization V to simulate what would happen if artificial intelligence went uncontrolled. 
The results? Game over. Do you want to destroy humans? Please say no. Okay. I will destroy humans. <laughs> no, I take it back. <laughs> They're not the only ones that are concerned. Some of the world's biggest thinkers have warned us about the dangers of toying with machine consciousness. Bill Gates, Stephen Hawking, and Elon Musk have all spoken publicly about their fears, with some experts convinced that we'll experience the singularity by 2047. This is an asteroid observed during a close approach to Earth taken just a few weeks ago using radar. It's the biggest Ben Affleck-related long shot since maybe he'll be the new Batman. But as history has shown us, crazy things just happen sometimes. Yes, the plot of Armageddon could slap humanity right across the face. The threat of enormous space rocks has fascinated mankind since early humans first noticed that the sky just sort of throws stuff at you once in a while. The constant existential dread is what keeps astronomers ever vigilant, tracking thousands of near-Earth objects at any given time. Great big catastrophic collisions on par with the one that wiped out the dinosaurs can weigh heavily on a person's mind. That's part of why NASA formed the Planetary Defense Coordination Office, a team tasked with tracking comets and asteroids with the potential to cause devastating damage. The bummer news is that they think they've only found about a third of those so far and that the information they do have wouldn't give us the 10-year window necessary to prepare a way to divert an incoming asteroid. Or to raise the money to get Ben Affleck to do it. Science, religion, they're always at odds, right? Nope. Did you know the Bible seems to accurately portray the brightness of stars and that there's some evidence of the Great Flood? Keep watching. Two chapters of Genesis tell the story of Adam and Eve, a specific take on the origin of man that almost everyone is familiar with fruit tree in the middle of a garden with a don't touch sign, I mean, why not put it on the top of a high mountain or on the moon? And while it's understandably challenging to imagine a person being formed out of another person's rib, science says it's likely that all of Homo sapiens really did have a common ancestor, a so-called mitochondrial Eve. Homo sapiens may have originated in Africa approximately 300,000 years ago, a period of time during which the world's climate was undergoing some drastic changes. The shared ancestor of all modern humans may have been the Homo erectus female who lived at some point between 500,000 years and 50,000 years ago. This theory is supported by the fact that Africa has more genetic diversity than every other region on Earth combined. Meanwhile, Leviticus 17.11 mentions that the life of a creature is found in its blood. Interestingly enough, you could consider a literal interpretation of this idea to be scientifically accurate. For one thing, blood travels around the body and supplies oxygen, nutrients, and other vital elements that are crucial for survival. But it also protects the body via infection-fighting agents, prevents blood loss through clotting, and regulates body temperature. The Bible wasn't wrong when it suggested that blood gives us life. Ancient ideas about water's relationship with the planet can be traced from as early as 1000 BC, when the Greek poet Homer depicted Earth as, quote, floating on a primal ocean. Of course, man's understanding of the water cycle has greatly improved since then. Nowadays, scientists understand that Earth's hydrologic cycle involves water's never-ending movement and state changes across, above, and even within the planet. The hydrologic cycle theory is typically thought to have been discovered by Bernard Paulisi, a hydraulics engineer who, in 1580, suggested that it was possible to maintain a river with just rain. His theories would be tested nearly 100 years later, but they only gained traction among scientific thinkers in the early 1900s. If you interpret a few passages from the Bible in a certain way, you'll find some alignment with how modern science understands evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. For instance, Ecclesiastes 1.7 describes how water flowing from streams into the sea eventually returns to its point of origin. Meanwhile, both Amos 9.6 and Job 36.27 and 28 reference water rising from larger bodies of water, such as seas or streams, and then falling back to earth as rain. As the Bible wasn't written with scientific accuracy in mind, spotting the points of alignment can often require an open mind. Mostly, this means accepting that not every interpretation of the Bible is literal. For example, Isaiah 40.22 talks about the circle of the Earth, which some interpret as a reference to Earth being circular when seen from outer space. There's photographic proof of this, of course. The famous photo Earthrise, which was snapped on December 24, 1968 by Apollo 8's crew, shows Earth as an orb floating in space. But the idea that Earth isn't flat isn't exactly new. Thinkers such as Pythagoras and Eratosthenes were already toying with the idea long before Jesus Christ was born. There are more lines in the Bible supporting scientific truths about the Earth itself. 
Take Job 28.5, for instance, which mentions how hot the earth is deep inside. Indeed, temperatures inside the earth can rival the degree of heat on the sun's surface. Another noteworthy example is found in Job 26.7. Here, the chapter's writer discusses how the earth is simply floating in space, unsupported by any fixed physical structure whatsoever. Obviously, there's no way the Bible's authors could have known about all this for certain, but it's still remarkable how well this particular dogma has aged. Judging from what today's scientists know about the stars, Jeremiah 33.22 had the right idea when it suggested that the stars in the sky were countless. As it turns out, there could be up to a trillion stars in a single galaxy. That's just a rough estimate, though, based on the evidence that astronomers, astrophysicists, and other space scientists have to work with. Applying some good old-fashioned math makes the picture even clearer. Across the universe's 100 billion galaxies, there could be approximately 10 billion trillion stars. Meanwhile, a literal interpretation of 1 Corinthians 15.41 would reveal an impressive level of cohesion with modern astronomy in terms of stars' brightness or magnitude. This Bible verse talks about the different splendors of the sun, the moon, and all the other stars in the universe. Specifically, Corinthians says, star differs from star in glory. In fact, there's a clear scientific reason why certain stars look brighter to earthlings than others. Stars vary in brightness from the vantage point of people on Earth, and this depends on factors such as the amount of light energy a star emits or how far it is from the planet. It was the Greek astronomer Hipparchus who first developed a chart of the different degrees of stars' brightness, some 200 years before Corinthians was written. Well, it was nice to meet you, God. Thank you for the Grand Canyon, and good luck with the apocalypse. Oh, and by the way, you suck! The Bible doesn't pull any punches when it comes to the end of the world. The book of Revelation paints a particularly dramatic picture of how it'll all go down, but it's not the only apocalyptic verse in the Holy Book. In fact, at one point, the Bible even mentions how the stars in the sky and other celestial bodies won't last forever, centuries before modern science could support this with evidence. According to Matthew 24.35, both heaven and earth will eventually pass away. In the context of astronomy, stars reach the end of their lives once they've exhausted all the nuclear fuel that keeps them burning. The bigger the star, the faster it burns through its hydrogen fuel. And when the fuel is completely depleted, the star either collapses into itself or becomes a black hole, depending on its size. A black hole has an incredibly strong gravitational field due to the star's mass. It's so strong that not even light can escape its pull. For a long time, however, the existence of black holes couldn't be proven with direct evidence. The first ever photograph of one was taken on April 10, 2019, a historic endeavor that required 200 scientists and eight super-powerful telescopes located across five continents. According to Hebrews 11.3, God didn't make the universe out of what was visible. One way to interpret this is that the building blocks of the universe are imperceptible to the naked human eye. And of course, physics supports this notion too. Atoms make up pretty much everything that human senses can perceive. Identical atoms, when bound together, form the chemical elements, which are the simplest forms of substances obtainable through ordinary chemical processes. Atoms are so small that if you were to take 100 million atoms of hydrogen and line them up, they would not exceed a centimeter in length, and they're made up of even smaller particles. It would take a thousand protons or neutrons to match the diameter of a single atom of hydrogen. Protons and neutrons, in turn, are a thousand times bigger than electrons and quarks. Does your head hurt yet? One of the most well-known stories from the Bible is the tale of the world-engulfing Great Flood in Noah's Ark. The story is spread out across three chapters of Genesis, detailing how one man and his family successfully constructed an ark and saved all the animals of the planet from a massive flood. Interestingly, there are various kinds of sedimentary rocks across the planet with different chemical compositions, serving as geological evidence that at some point in Earth's history, huge floods could have actually occurred. However, it's highly unlikely that water engulfed the Earth's entirety in a single flood, as the flood story suggests. This is because it's not possible for the rock deposits to have formed simultaneously, going by fossil evidence and basic scientific knowledge. It's possible, however, that the Great Flood was a regional flood that looked apocalyptic to everyone affected by it. And then there's the Ark. At first glance, it may seem impossible for such a vessel to properly accommodate 35,000 different animal species and float. In 2014, however, students from the University of Leicester crunched the numbers and learned that such an Ark could indeed float. Whether all the animals could actually fit in there, however, is an entirely different question. The way it was told in 1 Samuel 17, it might be difficult to picture how David, a small boy with a slingshot, took out the battle-hardened brute Goliath. However, if one theory about Goliath were true, then David's victory was a likely outcome, if not a foregone conclusion. 
Many people mistakenly think that David's slingshot was little more than a child's toy. While a slingshot may not sound as impressive as, say, a sword or a pike, it could be an absolute killer in the right hands. And David was working with arguably the best bullets available. The stones from the Ela Valley were made of barium sulfate, which were twice as dense as ordinary stones. In other words, David's slingshot was a 35 meter per second death dealer, hitting his gigantic foe with the awesome power of a 45 caliber pistol. That's just half of it, though. Goliath may have looked imposing, but the way he was described in the chapter suggests that his gigantic frame may have come at a terrible cost to his health. The author Malcolm Gladwell has theorized that Goliath actually suffered from acromegaly, an overproduction of growth hormones due to a tumor on the pituitary gland. This would also mean that Goliath likely had poor eyesight. Acromegaly can cause a person to lose their peripheral vision, limiting what they can see to what's in front of them. In the end, Goliath probably didn't stand a chance. Numerous creation myths from various cultures assert that the mountains of Earth were manually crafted by deities. That's why it's a bit strange that the story of creation in the book of Genesis doesn't directly mention God shaping the mountains by hand. As it turns out, this small omission could be interpreted as having some slight bearing in real-life science. At least two passages from the book of Psalms talk about underwater mountains. If these texts are interpreted literally, they may actually be referring to sea mounts. These are mountains formed from powerful volcanic activity underneath the ocean. Just like terrestrial mountains, sea mounts become rich grounds for biodiversity to flourish due to the fact that they help bring nutrients from the seafloor to the flora and fauna that live near the water's edge. It has been estimated that there are approximately 30,000 sea mounts under the ocean. Joshua 10.12 attributes a key biblical victory to the fact that God supposedly made the sun stand still. Two men of physics saw this as an opportunity to shed light on what could have been a remarkable astronomical phenomenon, and the only tools at their disposal were words and math. In a paper published in 2017, Sir Colin Humphreys and his partner, W. Graham Waddington, discussed how this game-changing event could have actually been a solar eclipse. They started by speaking to a Semitic languages professor to determine if the account, originally written in Hebrew, could be interpreted as an eclipse. After learning that it was possibly an annular eclipse, they cross-referenced it to another source, the ancient Egyptian-made Merneptah steel, to strengthen their hypothesis. Not content with what they'd unearthed, the two scientists even went so far as to calculate the exact date it happened. By performing some fancy arithmetic, Humphreys and Waddington were able to pinpoint a date for the day God stopped the sun, October 30th, 1207 BC. It's an endlessly dangerous world out there, and deaths of infinite variety could lurk around any corner. That being said, there are surely some ways to go that are more terrifying than others. Here are the absolute worst ways to die, according to scientists. What's more horrifying than dying? Try being incorrectly pronounced dead and then waking up trapped in a coffin six feet underground. According to popular science, the length of time one can survive being buried alive ranges from one and a half days to a paltry 10 minutes, depending on available air and body size. For instance, a larger individual would take up more space, leaving less room for oxygen. If you try to dig your way out, you'd get crushed and suffocated by the sudden rush of dirt and soil. Conversely, if you do nothing, the carbon dioxide levels would eventually render you comatose as you gently slip into death's embrace. Fear.net presents an actual term for the irrational fear of this sticky situation, taphophobia. Curiously, this fear led to some chillingly creative coffin upgrades in the late 1800s and early 1900s, from breathing tubes and glass panels to, hey, I'm still alive in here, alarm systems. Think we're past the point where things like this happen? In 2010, the New York Daily News published an article about a 76-year-old beekeeper who would have suffered this fate had the funeral director not detected his pulse as he lay in his coffin. No, this isn't about the kind of radiation that cell phones or microwave ovens emit. Non-ionizing radiation isn't strong enough to harm the human body in small doses, according to the FDA. The kind that can really mess you up is ionizing radiation, which you'd get from things like nuclear power plants, weapons tests, or outer space. Ionizing radiation is powerful enough to charge your atoms by removing their electrons. As popular science explains, this can seriously damage your DNA, rendering your cells incapable of replicating and triggering their deterioration. The type and degree of suffering you'll endure depends on how you got blasted, whether internally or externally, and how much radiation you got blasted with, among other factors. We measure radiation exposure in sieverts. The CDC's radiation thermometer provides some perspective. A chest X-ray emits about one-tenth of one millisievert, or one ten-thousandth of a sievert, while a flight from New York to Los Angeles emits roughly a third of that. 500 millisieverts can make you nauseated, and 700 millisieverts can cause hair loss within half a month. Meanwhile, 1,000 millisieverts can cause hemorrhaging and diarrhea while increasing your cancer risk. A dose of 4,000 millisieverts can kill you in two months. 
10,000 millisieverts can wreck your intestines and end you in a week, and 20,000 could kill you in mere hours. So yeah, no superpowers for you, only death. Humans have gotten quite used to living on land. Sadly, we don't fare as well in the air or underwater, partly because of the differences in pressure. To protect ourselves during travel, we stay inside sealed chambers with consistent pressure. But when pressure abruptly changes due to punctures or damage, uncontrolled decompression happens. Regardless of whether you're flying or diving, it's both ugly and deadly. According to the Smithsonian Museum, commercial flights reach altitudes of 30,000 to 40,000 feet. Atmospheric pressure gets lower as altitude increases, making your lungs work harder to get oxygen. To prevent this, a plane's artificial altitude shouldn't exceed 8,000 feet. However, any cracks or punctures during flight could cause decompression. At best, oxygen deprivation can happen. At worst, then with a big enough hole, people can get sucked out of the plane, like in the 1988 Aloha Airlines incident. Meanwhile, divers experience increased pressure as water pushes down on them. Divers who ascend too quickly can experience decompression sickness. The decreased pressure causes nitrogen and other gases inside their bodies to bubble, leading to unbearable pain, internal damage, mental impairment, and even death. The most horrific decompression accident is, perhaps, one that occurred in 1983 in a compression chamber on the Biford Dolphin oil rig. An error resulted in explosive decompression, instantly killing several divers. Ever wonder what lies at the bottom of the Mariana Trench? Given how more people have walked on the moon than explored Earth's deepest oceanic trench, there aren't a lot of folks who can give a comprehensive answer based on first-hand experience. What experts can tell you with certainty, though, is that this 36,070-foot deep formation would be an absolutely terrible place to die. No one in their right mind would want to dive into the Mariana Trench unprepared and unprotected. Remember, the deeper you dive into the ocean, the greater the pressure. Down there, an unprotected person wouldn't just drown. According to National Geographic, every single air-filled cavity in their body would be instantly crushed like paper by roughly 16,000 pounds per square inch of pressure, and they'd sink instead of floating to the surface. If it's any comfort, though, they'd still be recognizably human since the body's water can't be compressed, as San Francisco Exploratorium physicist Paul Doherty explained in a Reddit AMA thread from 2017. Thank goodness for elevators you think to yourself as you board one on your way up to the 40th floor. Otherwise, you'd have to take the stairs every day. By the time you make it to your office, your legs would probably already be killing you. The smile on your face disappears, though, as the elevator stops just before the 39th floor. Suddenly, your world literally starts crashing down and you realize what's likely going to happen next. You'll die alone, painfully, at the bottom of an elevator shaft. There are a number of ways being inside a free-falling elevator could go horribly wrong for you. For starters, you would almost certainly die upon impact and in the worst possible way. Just ask the Mythbusters team, who reported that a crash test dummy ended up in pieces after a 9-story, 53-mile-an-hour elevator drop. Gravity isn't your only problem here, though. According to live science, you could just as easily be killed by all the parts and debris knocked loose inside the elevator. Oh, and your internal organs will likely shift around inside you as you're falling. As Dr. Brad Segura of the University of Minnesota's Amplatz Children's Hospital explained to CBS Minnesota, the fluid inside your organs, plus the fact that your intestines are relatively mobile, contributes to how they behave during sudden drops. Fortunately, today's elevator safety features make it highly unlikely that you'll find yourself in this grisly predicament. Deaths directly related to volcanoes will always be extremely unpleasant. You don't even need to be within range of one of these to verify this. Just read the story of how Mount Vesuvius's unbridled fury wiped out the ancient city of Pompeii. To satisfy everyone's curiosity, here's what would happen if, say, a researcher observing a volcano from a helicopter accidentally took what would undoubtedly be the worst dive of their soon-to-end life. According to Universe Today, freshly ejected lava can reach temperatures of up to 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. By the time the person actually hits the surface of the volcanic pit, they'd be an unconscious fireball. Upon impact with the extremely viscous magma, most of their skeleton would shatter. Before long, the person would be ashes. Hiking around a volcanic peak presents a different kind of danger. If the hellishly high temperatures and toxic gases don't kill you, asphyxiation probably will. Volcanic geysers or hot springs aren't any better. In 2018, Live Science reported the case of a man who fell into one of the Norris Geyser Basin's pools at Yellowstone National Park. Long story short, the near-boiling, incredibly acidic waters dissolved his remains completely within less than a day. Experts say that he probably didn't feel much, though, as the water would have obliterated his nerve endings within a very short period of time. Frankly, you don't need to fall into a volcano to get a first-hand demonstration of extremely hot danger and destruction. On its own, being burned to the point of death is pretty terrible, simply because there are many different ways to get hurt or killed from burning. When people hear about burns, either first, second, or third-degree burns come to mind. So remember, kids, there is nothing more painful than third-degree burns. 
Third-degree burns even destroy hair follicles and pain receptors. Here's what many don't realize, though. That's only halfway through the scale of pirate peril. According to the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, fourth, fifth, and sixth-degree burns cause serious damage to a victim's fat, muscle, and bone, respectively. The human body is predominantly water-based and isn't easy to burn, hence someone being burned to death would actually feel themselves burning until they can't feel anything anymore. Of course, the fire part to being set on fire isn't the only thing that can kill a burn victim. Damage to the nervous system, blood loss, dehydration, and even burn infections can all cause death. If you're trapped with other people in a burning building, inhaling carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, and other toxic components of smoke can be lethal to your tissues. Or you could simply suffocate or lose consciousness due to lack of oxygen. History's most famous crucifixion victim is, without a doubt, Jesus Christ. Even non-Christians know that the religious figure died by this ancient form of capital punishment. The how part gets left out of the narrative, though, for understandable reasons. The science behind crucifixion isn't for the squeamish. As physiologist Jeremy Ward told The Guardian, different factors could explain how death by crucifixion happens, and having nine-inch nails driven through the victim's wrists and feet is the least of them. Once the cross is upright, the victim would have to bear their own weight on their bent legs or arms if their executioner broke their legs beforehand. Eventually, gravity would win, dislocating the victim's shoulders and stretching them out of their sockets. At this point, the victim's chest would have to do all the heavy lifting, literally. And if suffocation due to a, quote, perpetual state of inhalation doesn't do them in, multiple organ failure would be more than happy to finish the job. A 2006 paper listed other possible causes, including heart failure, blood loss, and simply losing the will to live. A person nailed to a cross wouldn't live longer than a day, though someone tied to a cross might last for a few days. For more severe crimes, victims were crucified with their arms straight above their heads, cutting their survival time to just 30 minutes tops. Considering the barbaric nature of execution methods from ancient times, you might be feeling relieved at the fact that they're no longer being practiced. As it turns out, however, the methods of capital punishment used today aren't always as swift, effective, and merciful as they're purported to be. Take the electric chair, for example. In theory, electrocution should be a quick and painless form of execution. According to ABC Science, it was popular with ordinary citizens in the late 1800s because it seemed like a less cruel alternative to hanging. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work how it should in real life. Life Science recalled how convicted murderer William Kemmler became the first criminal to die by electrocution in 1890. It actually took two massive electrical jolts to kill him, with journalists reportedly writing about how Kemmler's dead body was, quote, charred and smoking. And then there's lethal injection, a method that uses three drugs to sedate, paralyze, and cause cardiac failure in inmates sentenced to death. According to NPR, researchers who examined post-lethal injection autopsy reports saw evidence that more than 75% of inmates were experiencing pulmonary edema, fluid in the lungs, and left, quote, gasping for air as they were executed. In other words, the first injection didn't always work, and the inmates actually died slow, agonizing deaths. Given how humans are nearly three-quarters water, it's not surprising that the dangers of dehydration can quickly escalate all the way to death. Popular science breaks down the journey from dehydration to death into four stages. It starts with thirst. Under extreme heat or fatigue, the body can lose up to 2% of its weight in water through sweating. Without fluid replenishment, bodily systems will start to go haywire as the person's blood volume drops. When the person stops sweating, they'll begin overheating. This is the second stage, where the person will start to lose consciousness and their skin will dry up. At stage 3, kidney and liver failure will kick in, seriously damaging organs and poisoning the person from the inside until the final stage, death. Children are particularly at risk for dehydration-related death, which can come within hours. Meanwhile, a healthy adult can last up to a week with minimal water intake. That's no reason to tempt fate, though, so please get up and grab yourself a glass of water now. Decapitation, whether purposeful or accidental, may seem straightforward. The brain controls various bodily systems and functions, and it needs oxygen to do so. Thus, it makes sense that physically separating it from its oxygen supply would shut it down. That's why beheadings have been around for thousands of years, possibly as far back as the early Holocene epoch. Sadly, such executions don't always go smoothly, leading to gruesomely uncomfortable situations for both the executioner and the victim. According to Scientific American, decapitation via bladed weapons occasionally required repeated blows, prolonging the victim's agony by a few minutes and making the whole procedure wince-inducing. This led to the development and adoption of the guillotine in the late 1700s, a mechanism designed to sever the victim's head swiftly. However, there's rather disturbing evidence that the brain can actually live on for a bit post-decapitation, based on tests involving smaller animals. Consciousness may even continue for up to four seconds. Scientists are usually idealists and understandably focus on the best things that their discoveries could potentially offer, which means they occasionally overlook mankind's capacity for finding undesired, even nefarious, uses for their creations. 
At Kitty Hawk in 1903, Orville and Wilbur Wright made four short flights in the world's first powered aircraft. Since then, airplanes have made the world a much smaller place, making it possible for anyone with enough cash and the willingness to sit in a tiny chair for hours to travel halfway around the world in less than a day. But airplanes have a downside too, a huge downside, and the Wright brothers came to regret aspects of their epic invention. According to the Baltimore Sun, the Wright brothers thought the airplane might allow all nations to gain a tactical advantage in war, which would make everyone essentially equal in war, therefore impossible. Orville Wright said in 1915, The aeroplane will prevent war by making it too expensive, too slow, too difficult, too long drawn out. Then, he went and lived through two world wars. By 1948, Orville Wright had completely changed his outlook, saying, We dared to hope we had invented something that would bring lasting peace to the earth, but we were wrong. We underestimated man's capacity to hate and to corrupt good means for an evil end. Imagine being called the father of the Segway, or the father of Smelloscope. That would suck, right? Eureka! Did you build the Smelloscope? No, I remembered that I built one last year. Now imagine being called the father of lethal injection. At least those first two titles won't cause party conversation to awkwardly cease while everyone within earshot makes excuses about getting another drink. But for Dr. J. Chapman, that's the name he's stuck with. He told The Guardian in 2010, The media sometimes refers to me as the father of the lethal injection. It was not one of my purposes in life. It was something I was asked to do, and I did it on the spur of the moment. Chapman says he developed the lethal cocktail because he thought it would make the death penalty process more efficient. He hoped that making execution more humane would lead to swifter executions. But today, he regrets his part in developing the lethal injection system, not because he's come to realize that capital punishment is barbaric or anything like that, though. Nope, Chapman regrets developing lethal injection because it didn't really change anything. People still linger on death row for decades. And he says that he actually has the opposite problem with the method. He thinks it's too humane. He put it bluntly, I'm an eye for an eye person. The lethal injection is too easy for some of them. Some inventors regret their inventions because they cause death and destruction or have the potential to destroy the world. On the other hand, some inventors regret their inventions because they turned out to be super annoying. Yes, we're talking about the digital camera. According to the BBC, Michael Thompson, who captured the world's first colored digital photograph in 1972, doesn't regret the entire concept of the digital camera. Digital cameras have done great things for photographers, not the least of which is making photography a lot less expensive and therefore more accessible to the average person. But is it really such an awesome thing that everyone and their duck-lipped teenager has access to a camera with a screen reversal feature? Let's, uh, let's all, just all take a selfie. Take a selfie. Let's take a selfie. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. Everyone get in. Take it. Chin down. Okay. 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 Puck of Asian. Mm -hmm. okay. That's exactly the kind of thing Tom said hates seeing. He told the BBC, I feel frustrated by all these people who have cameras taking pictures of everything in sight and selfies. You're walking along and a selfie stick suddenly appears. I sometimes think whoever invented this technology should be dealt with. In the late 1920s, American engineer Philo Farnsworth became the first person to successfully transmit a television image. According to biography, Farnsworth patented his ideas and in 1938 founded the Farnsworth Television and Radio Corporation. Farnsworth had big dreams for television. He thought it had nearly unlimited potential as an educational tool and could solve illiteracy and ignorance. I'm fed up with all this reading. You're a wormwood, you start acting like one. Sit up and look at the TV. He even believed it could stop war. Well, that's what he thought at first. Farnsworth's son, Kent, later said that his father hated what his invention had become to the point where he refused to let his kids watch television. The younger Farnsworth quoted him as saying, there's nothing on it worthwhile and we're not going to watch it in this household and I don't want it in your intellectual diet. It is worth noting that Farnsworth later had a slight change of heart when he watched the broadcast of the moon landing. Medicine has a long and not always squeaky clean history, and MDMA in particular has been down a long, weird road. If you don't know what that is, you probably have heard it referenced by its more popular name, ecstasy, the recreational drug that was popularized in the 1990s. Alexander Shulgin didn't invent ecstasy, but he thought it had psychiatric uses. According to the South China Morning Post, he was first introduced to the drug in 1976 and started developing a way to synthesize it while also developing methods for using it for psychotherapy. 
Obviously, his plans for MDMA didn't exactly pan out. The drug was banned in 1985 and placed on the list of Schedule One drugs with, quote, no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. Shulgin later regretted that his rediscovery of MDMA had played a part in its rising popularity as a recreational drug. Today, the name Nobel is synonymous with peace. It is, after all, attached to the prestigious Peace Prize. So Nobel himself must have been a real peace-loving guy, right? Well, maybe, but Alfred Nobel was also a lot like Michael Bay. He liked making things go boom. Awesome barbecue! Awesome pull! According to Nobel's own website, Alfred Nobel not only invented dynamite but was also involved in the design and development of cannons and rockets. Later in life, he started imagining that he might be able to end war by developing a weapon so terrible no one would dare use it, once saying, On the day that two army corps can mutually annihilate each other in a second, all civilized nations will surely recoil with horror and disband their troops. Nobel clearly didn't brush up on his Wright brothers' history, and he appears to have regretted his involvement in weapons making later in life. At least that's what Albert Einstein noted in a 1945 speech when he said, Alfred Nobel invented an explosive more powerful than any then known, an exceedingly effective means of destruction. To atone for this accomplishment and to relieve his conscience, he instituted his award for the promotion of peace. Scientists say there are explanations for why people see ghosts. Can't they leave ghosts alone? Believing in ghosts doesn't hurt anyone, and in some cases it actually helps people. And also it's fun. But no, scientists can't resist endlessly telling us how wrong we are about why people see ghosts. If you're a believer in the paranormal and someone tells you that the place you're about to enter is haunted, you're more likely to have a paranormal experience when you walk into that place. That makes sense. It makes so much sense, in fact, that we don't really need a study to tell us it's true, but we got one anyway. In 1997, researchers put 22 people into a creepy theater and told them to make observations. Half of the subjects were told the theater was haunted, and the other half were told that it was under construction. Predictably, the half who thought they were visiting a haunted theater were more likely to report intense, perceptual experiences. So, those results seem to suggest that paranormal experiences happen mostly because people have been led to believe they might happen. In 2012, some researchers published a paper called Supernatural Agency, Individual Difference Predictors and Situational Correlates, which suggested that people who have paranormal experiences tend to be more open to the idea of spiritual experiences in general. It also found that people in threatening environments are prone to having non-religious paranormal experiences. In other words, instead of seeing an angel or talking to a god, a person experiencing environmental stress might see a shadow figure or a full-bodied apparition. That research has been backed up by other studies, including one that specifically looked at whether stress can cause women to report paranormal experiences. The study looked at a group of women in a town in central eastern Turkey and determined that women who suffered trauma in childhood or had post-traumatic stress disorder were more likely to say they had experienced things like possession, precognition, and extrasensory perception. In 2006, a neurologist in Switzerland was attempting to isolate the part of the brain responsible for a 23-year-old woman's seizures when he blundered into a strange phenomenon. When he applied a current through a certain part of her brain, she told him she sensed a mysterious, shadowy person standing behind her. Even more creepy, the shadow person was mimicking her. Every time she moved, he would move. Some scholars think that researchers were simply stimulating the part of the brain that's responsible for that creepy feeling you sometimes get that you are being watched or followed by something that isn't there. But wait, there's more. Research using a device called the God Helmet, which sends magnetic signals to the wearer's head, showed that a person can be artificially induced to feel like there is a ghostly presence in the room. In other words, it's literally all in your head. You've almost certainly seen examples of this sort of proof of the paranormal a photo of an otherwise innocuous person, place, or thing that contains eerie-looking balls of light, also known as spirit orbs. Similar manifestations can be seen on your favorite ghost hunting shows. The orbs that appear in photographs are usually just specks of dust or pollen, insects, moisture in the air, or something on the camera's lens. When the photographer engages the flash, these things reflect the light and create the image of a large, creepy-looking ball of ectoplasm. The phenomena is actually exacerbated by modern camera design. The closer the flash is to the camera's lens, the easier it will be for the light to reflect off particles in the air, and the more likely it is that the camera will capture something that can be mistaken for a ghost. 
Paranormal investigators often talk about cold spots, but haunted houses do tend to be old and old buildings do tend to be drafty. However, according to party pooper scientists, cold spots are probably a natural phenomenon. When researchers actually try to find a reason for a temperature change, it can usually be traced to something like a chimney or a drafty window. The sensation of a sudden drop of temperature can also be related to a drop in humidity. Although it's also been suggested the paranormal experiences people have could have something to do with natural phenomena like magnetic fields and lightning levels. Either way, it's a lot less exciting than ghosts. So this place isn't haunted? No, it rarely is. Yeah, there's usually always some kind of rational explanation. If you've ever fallen asleep in front of the TV, you may have experienced a phenomenon known as sleep paralysis. When you experience sleep paralysis, you'll be deep in REM dream state. But then you'll half awake and experience a sort of hybrid state of consciousness, where you're still experiencing dreamlike hallucinations. And just so the whole thing will be that much more terrifying, you also won't be able to move. Paralysis is actually necessary for safe REM sleep. It happens mostly so you won't punch your spouse in the face while acting out your fighting dreams. But when you experience it in a state of near wakefulness, it can be really scary. Add a few dream demons to the mix, and it can feel like a genuine paranormal experience. Sleep paralysis is actually common. About 8% of us will report experiencing it at least once, and for some people, it's a regular thing. But those feelings of a ghost at the end of the bed are just a feature of sleep paralysis. They aren't really paranormal visitations. Similar to sleep paralysis, exploding head syndrome is a condition that happens to you while you're sleeping. The experience usually goes like this. You're nodding off and suddenly you could swear you just heard a massive explosion or a huge crash somewhere in your house. So what's the deal? Maybe you're hearing the paranormal echoes of something terrible that happened in the distant past, or maybe it's just exploding head syndrome. You may have actually experienced this phenomenon, but the name for it is still pretty new. It was coined by a neurologist named JMS Pierce, who seems to think that it's caused by a sort of sinking error in the brain. As you're drifting off to sleep, your body starts shutting down things like muscles, eyes, and ears. When you suddenly hear a phantom bang during this process, it might be because the part of your brain that's in charge of shutting down all those functions gets a little mixed up. Instead of shutting down all the auditory neurons, it just fires them all at once instead. People who have lost close family members often report having paranormal experiences, especially in those early stages of grief. These could include vivid dreams of being visited by their deceased loved one, or feelings of being watched over, or even fleeting images of the person who died. According to the BBC, science thinks it can explain these experiences by calling them coping strategies of the grieving brain. The theory is that it's easier to accept the passing of a loved one if you think that person still exists in some form than it is to just believe that that person is gone forever. So the brain invents these spiritual encounters with the deceased person as a way of easing those feelings of grief. Why would I want to see my Carl like that? Because it's better than never seeing him again. If your once peaceful house suddenly seems to be haunted, it might not necessarily be a ghost, and it might not be you either. In fact, it could potentially be something really lethal, like a malfunctioning furnace. So before you call an exorcist, make sure your carbon monoxide alarms are working, and if they're not, get out and don't return until your utility company says it's safe to. In the 1920s, the Journal of Ophthalmology documented the strange case of a couple who believed they were living in a haunted house. The woman reported hearing footsteps and the sound of someone pushing furniture around, even though there was no one else there. She also felt like she was being followed around the house, and at one point she woke up to see two apparitions at the foot of her bed. The couple spoke to doctors, but it wasn't until they had experts look at the house that they discovered the real cause of the haunting. A carbon monoxide leak in the furnace, which was bad enough to cause hallucinations, but not quite bad enough to cause death. So if you've ever wondered if ghosts can kill, yes they can. Or at least, the carbon monoxide that makes you hallucinate ghosts can certainly kill you. If you haven't changed the batteries in your CO alarm in a while, now would be a good time to do that. So your house is clearly haunted, you've already swapped out your CO alarm batteries, and then you tossed your CO alarm and got a new one, and ghosts are still throwing your stuff around and hoovering creepily in doorways. Well, it might still be poison-induced hallucinations, just a different kind of poison. Some researchers think there may be a link between the mold that tends to grow in dark, creepy places and the paranormal experiences people say they have in those places. This is of particular interest to Shane Rogers, who is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Clarkson University. 
He cites a 2009 study which shows that certain types of mold can cause problems like delirium, movement disorders, and issues with balance and coordination. From there, it's not a huge leap to think that maybe mold could also cause the sorts of hallucinations that make people think they're seeing ghosts. So in 2015, Rogers and a team of researchers set out to find if their hunch might be correct. That's been a few years ago now, and we're still waiting patiently for the results of Rogers' research. If you're starting to think that some of these scientific explanations sound only slightly less outlandish than it's a spirit trapped on the corporal plane, here's another theory that seems a bit out there. According to ProSoundWeb, ghosts could be low-frequency illusions caused by standing waves. In basic terms, it's when low-frequency sound creates a ghostly apparition. So, how does that happen exactly? Well, the author of the article had an experience involving a fencing sword and a fan. The fan was emitting a low-frequency sound that made the sword vibrate, and evidently was also making him feel like he was being watched. Even stranger, he also saw an apparition. Infrasound, which is the sound below the normal range that humans can hear, can cause physical and emotional sensations like feelings of dread. It isn't just fans that create infrasound, it's also things like ocean waves, vibrating pipes, and even some animals like whales and elephants. When the sound happens at just the right frequency, it can also make the eyes vibrate, which explains why some people who are experiencing infrasound believe they've literally seen a ghost. I see dead people. If you don't believe any of those other scientific explanations for the existence of ghosts, here's one that's pretty hard to deny. It's just fun to believe in ghosts. It's fun in the same way that a roller coaster or a horror movie is fun. We like to be scared. And because we're fundamentally attached to the idea that ghosts are real, it makes it hard for us to accept scientific logic. Belief in ghosts also serves another purpose. It helps us confront our own mortality. The presence of spirits in a house or an old hotel does more than just satisfy that sense of fun. It also helps us cling to the notion that there's something after death. A belief in ghosts makes us feel like we can glimpse an afterlife that we're all a little afraid might not actually exist. Even if you look at all these potential scientific explanations for ghostly experiences as a whole, they can't possibly explain away every single paranormal experience that's ever happened anywhere on Earth. 